um, and had kind of figured out how to, to go to market. How do we do the compliance? How do we do all of the, the vendor risk issues around insurance, et cetera? Um, we're really good at that. And that that's what attracted me to MindSpan. And so I, I ended up joining the company and then buying it. Warning, Damian Andrews' growing revenue and profit, if implemented, will put more money in your pocket. Please use with caution. Welcome to Damian Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit with international speaker and revenue and growth specialist, Damian Andrews. This is your source for practical, usable, and simple action steps that you can do every day to put more money in your pocket. And now, the host of Damian Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit, Damian Andrews. And the crowd cheers widely to the trumpeting blasts of elephants sliding through eyes of needles. This is Damien Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit, the program that deals with all things that puts more cash in your pocket. This is the show that handles your revenue riddles, profit puzzles, operational oddities, and culture conundrums. Now, I am the one, the only Damien Andrews, and on today's show is the amazing and wonderful Rich Edwards. Now, Rich is the CEO of MindSpan Systems, which helps community financial institutions transform themselves with data-driven strategies and technology. His area of expertise in, is in the convergence of analytics, marketing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning for financial institutions. Rich also has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, a Master of Business in Administration, and has served as an engineering officer in the U.S. Army. Rich, welcome and pleasure to have you on the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, David. Now, it's wonderful. And I know you've got a lot of experience because you, you worked with IBM and, and transferred into business mm -hmm. um, and owning your own business as well. Let's talk about that transition. There's a lot of people out there starting with business. What are the, some of the biggest misconceptions people have when starting their own business? Yeah, um, for me, it was it was probably a, a, a an unusual or a late in life move. Um, my my background, just from a career standpoint, like like you said, I was had an engineering uh, undergraduate and. Uh, I went right into the military um, out of, after school. Uh, this was in the 90s, so it was a completely different experience than it is today. Uh, I actually got out in 99. Um, and uh, at, at that point, I, I went and worked kind of in an operational role in manufacturing for a few years uh, and then decided to go back into school and get my MBA, and trying to kind of broaden it and get a little bit more round out the edges of, you know, there's a bunch of stuff I don't know. And I think at that point, that was probably the best move for me for how to make that happen and open up a lot of doors, made a lot of connections. And I eventually ended up in uh, at, at IBM and I was working more so in, in a marketing focus, but on the software product management side, which is really about, you know, at that level for enterprise software, it has a, has a lot to do, and the way IBM was doing it at the time, it has a lot to do with understanding the business problems that we're solving and then helping transfer that into requirements that we would then go build on top of in the context of not only what our customers wanted, but what competitors were doing, what the trends in the market were, et cetera. And so I kind of worked on the, the back end of um, pretty large um enterprise data center automation, things along that lines. Spent most of my time with uh, very large financial institutions, government institutions, doing things like um, uh, large scale storage, a lot of work in compliance for financial institutions for things like high availability, disaster recovery, things along that lines. And so it was it was one of those jobs where it was it was a lot of a lot of customer facing time 
and usually not in a sales scenario. So it was, you know, talking to the people that were actually using the product, uh, the people that were making the decisions on their technical strategy, both from the business side and also on the IT side. Um, so it was really interesting. We had a couple of like really, really fantastic customer councils that I don't think I have seen replicated anywhere else, ex except maybe in extreme cases. You think about like what Salesforce does and like how they leverage the Dreamforce event. That might be like a comparison. It was a much smaller group, but it was really a collaborative effort of like, where do they need us to go um, from a business requirement standpoint? And that was that was a fantastic experience to be part of that. And um, around 2013, um, and this was just, you know, luck and chance that made it happen. Uh, I was tapped to go work in a new business unit that was eventually what became IBM Watson. It was the artificial intelligence unit. And it, it wasn't because I had any deep background in that. It was more so, at, by that point in my career, I was pretty good at like getting stuff done within IBM, particularly from a new product standpoint, like bringing things through that process. And that's kind of what they needed because they wanted to like introduce a bunch of new offerings. Um, and so I got brought in for that, plus my background in, in banking and financial services uh, to kind of, you know, do the translation on that side and ended up spending three and a half, almost four years kind of drinking from the fire hose on what the state of the art was then and where it was going. Mm -hmm. um, and just really haven't stopped from that standpoint. So I, I've been kind of working in this intersection between machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, and banking and finance for a little bit more than ten years at this point. Um, so that was a that was a great job. It was a it was a great role. Um, but eventually, kind of got to a point where the decisions IBM was making, where they wanted to go with this, which was much more having having the thing and having the reputation and using that to leverage their presence in large enterprise, particularly from a services standpoint, a business services standpoint, versus being product focused. I kind of saw the writing on the wall of like where my role was going to be going forward and it was time to move on. And so really what I really what I wanted, and this kind of is like the okay, so how do you make the leap and you know for me in my mid 40s at that point, um, to into entrepreneurship, having worked for some of the biggest organizations in the world, you know, the, the U.S. government and then IBM, um, it, it, it was, okay, what's, what's your premise? Like, what are you looking for? And my thought was, clearly AI is in this resurgence. We're kind of out of the quote-unquote AI winner. Um, and I have this insight into what the requirements and needs of, of of banking and financial services are, what what can I find that kind of like is the intersection between those two things? And it eventually led me to MindSpan Systems, who had been in operations for a little more than 10 years at that point uh, and was kind of being run by the founder. And he was kind of ready to go on and do different things. And, and I kind of saw the the base capability, the really the base competence and experience that the team had, particularly with um, regulated industries, which which was primarily uh, banking, financial services, and healthcare, um, and they they were really good at it. Like they knew how to do um, a lot of business intelligence work, a lot of cloud data warehouse work, um, things that had to do with handling and manipulating regulated data, where there was a lot of compliance issues. In it. Um, and had kind of figured out how to, to go to market. How do we do the compliance? How do we do all of the, the vendor risk issues around insurance, et cetera? Um, we're really good at that. And that that's what attracted me to MindSpan. And so I, I ended up joining the company and then buying it from the, uh, from the, um, uh, the, the, the founder who had started the company. And that kind of started us on our way. And that was about 2018 I started. So that's kind of how I, kind of jumped in with both feet um, <laughs> atypically later in life to do that. From that side of things, I mean, because there, there are two ways to to get into business. One is start your own. 
um, to and do what you did was was buy a business. Mm-hmm. How does someone, I, when you're buying a business, how do you identify what are the key risks that they you need to assess before getting in there and, and knowing that you, you're going to get something that is going to be viable going forward? What were some mm-hmm. of the things that you looked at? Yeah, you know, some of the, the, the big elements are of, you know, what is it you're exactly buying? Like, what are you buying? Um, obviously, there's things where you have book value of assets, like, you know, property, things like that, which was not the case here. There was a small slice of intellectual capital, and that gets a lot wonkier about how you value something like that, how much you should mm. pay for it. And it's more how you think about what am I going to do with it and and what do I hope to benefit from that? And then, you know, appropriate discount factor and factor in that way. And then the other part is the business as it runs, which is, which is, you know, frankly, a rather boring spreadsheet drill of some version of discounted cash flow, right? Which is, mm-hmm. which is what I ended up doing, right? That that's kind of how I valued the business and, and made the jump. Now, my expectations were I wasn't going to do exactly what, the business was doing before and operated the same way it was before. I really wanted to transform it or at least use it as a springboard into something else. And the something else was this kind of adding in and being able to take advantage of the, the trends around, around AI and where I thought that was going and what I thought I could add, you know, as, as, as the leader and the CEO. Um, so that's what kind of led me there. You know, the, the biggest things from, from a risk standpoint is, is obviously, can I do this? Um, and, you know, how strong is the team that's in there? Um, depending on, on the size of the business, there, there's elements of like, you know, for me, I was buying an established business, right? So a lot of the questions were, well, what is the existing owner operator? What is his role in the business? Like, how does he really add value and what is my ability to to step in and replace them, right? Because a lot of that value. Um, and, and in this case, he was primarily sales focused um, from what he was doing. Um, so a lot of it was around the relationship that he had with clients and the ability to kind of keep that going, maintain and transition that relationship. So so for me in this aspect, that was one of the, the bigger risks. Um, and then obviously the relationship with the employees that are with there. Cause you know, for somebody who's been in business for a decade and had a rather sizable number of the employees had worked for him for that time, like there's an element of loyalty uh, around that too. And I'm not the old guy. Right. So kind of, you know, what, what are the things that you're going to have to do um, to at least buy yourself enough time to prove yourself to a new team? Um, and, and I would say, really, my my experience in the Army, um, which as as a military officer in the U.S. Army, it's primary. You're not, you're not there for your technical expertise. There's some aspect of that. You're primarily there as as a leader. Your your biggest job is kind of unit cohesiveness, and and there's a there's a lot of things that you kind of take for granted when you're there about like how transitions work and continuity of of not necessarily control but certainly continuity of of culture right how do you mm. kind of maintain things along so like a, a lot of my experience there was was very helpful uh, mm. from that standpoint and, and I think one of the things as somebody who had not spent a single day as either a CEO or an entrepreneur. Um, Understanding that that was one of the bigger risks and really leaning into that, like over indexing it to um, a certain extent to to really make sure that I communicated the the right things in the right way. Um, One of one of the one of the issues. And again, this is you know we're like five years ago. to be to be blunt, I'm a middle aged white guy, and the guy I bought the company from was not, and mm-hmm. so that was something I was sensitive to. That I was like, mm-hmm. this may not go well, right? right. I have to assume it's not going to go well. Mm-hmm. And so when I had the first meeting with everybody when he announced that I was buying the company, you know, I was like, 
I made that. This is the elephant in the room. Let me tell you about me and my background. Also, here's everybody who's worked for me in the past 10 years. They've all agreed to talk to any of you uh, about what it's like to work for me. Here's their contact information. And here are the people by, you know, age, sex, and race um, that you may want to talk to. These are the people who do not look like me, do not have the background with me, but have several years of experience working for me, right? Um, I, I don't know that I've heard anybody else kind of going to that extent for mm. the employees that are working for them. That, not that I'm a great guy or I'm a smart guy or anything, but it was more being driven by the sense of like, I don't know how well this is going to be received when I walk in the room. Um, and I, I need, I need to show beyond good faith about what I'm doing to make that transition smooth. So, cause what you mentioned there, you, you said you communicated thing, the right things in the right way. And was part of that creating that, that trust or there is a, an element of security here with this transition because obviously transitions can be really um, unnerving for people uh, and even scary. Yeah. And I know from yeah. my experience when I worked in corporate recovery, I'd walk into a company and I'd be the boss right there. And, and my first meeting was, okay, your boss is no longer your boss. I'm your boss and I'm right. taking over. And that obviously had to be handled with some care You've actually you've gone to a lot of research by the sounds of it to go. Okay, here's some things to put you at ease. Was there any other factors that helped the employees be put at ease? Because as you said, you needed that continuity of business to move mm -hmm. forward. They had a great relationship with the founder, a long um, and loyal relationship, if I heard you correctly, yeah. with mm -hmm. the founder. And now they've got this transition where this completely different person is coming in and taking charge. So from that side of things, how was that? Um, was there anything else that you had put in place to enable that transition to go smoothly? Um, I, I think be, beyond that, um, cause, cause again, I understand like, that's not the end of it. That that's just mm -hmm. buy me enough time so that you can get to know me. Right. And then I'm going to make the investment in the relationship with everybody one-on-one -on -one who directly reported with me and beyond that to, to yeah. you know, Try to prove that and, and at least give me enough time to, to prove myself. Right. So that that's one aspect. The, the other one is what do I what is the really critical things I need to do um, to kind of provide that security? Right. And, and a lot of that had to do with the client relationships. And so mm. that was the other aspect. Um, one of the things that I had worked out with the, with the previous owner was was a transition period. Um, where he was, he was primarily focused on let's go, let's go visit all of the customers. So, mm. Sometimes multiple times if necessary, right? Yeah. To to make sure that they're comfortable with with the transition, that they're going to be taken care of. Because again, some of these were like fairly critical systems. These are like you know, customer systems, customer data systems. They want to make sure that. Um, they're going to continue to be taken care of with at least the same level of care that they've been gotten before. And they've mm. become very comfortable with, um, with the previous owner. I, again, having, having worked with some of them for upwards of a decade. Um, so that was the, the other thing is yeah. trying to over invest in those relationships uh, to kind of get through that transition. Um, and that, that was the other part of it. And then being very transparent about that with everybody as well. Um, that, that I, you know, I try to, um, over communicate, you know, mm. in those first couple of weeks and months. And, and the, the, the other aspect here was, um, and this is kind of how I had worked before that. So I was at least comfortable with it. It was, it was almost completely remote. Um, so, you, you know, taking the effort of getting on an airplane and traveling to meet everybody one-on-one, -on -one, mm. um, that was that was it took some time it took some effort on my part particularly mm -hmm. when i'm trying to understand everything else it would have been very easy to say yeah 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 i'll get to that <laughs> but um you know that was something that i put at the front of what i was doing uh again to not leave anybody in the lurch about what it was what was going to happen next is my job secure or are we going in a completely different direct right like all of those things and then being very open to 
um, and, and receptive and inviting, you know, frank questions, like ask mm. me hard questions. Oh. And, and, you know, I tried to imagine what, 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 like, what are the really terrible questions somebody has in their head? Like, what, what are the questions that their spouse is going to ask them when they go home that night and say, mm-hmm. oh, by the way, the company got sold and this new guy took over, right? Mm. What's, what's the worry be that they're going to get asked at the dinner table? And so, you know, I think I had like 10 or 12. I, I, I had kind of created an FAQ. Like, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Like, am I going to lose my job? Is, you know, is my salary going to get cut? Is that like we're going to lose benefits? So we got, right. I kind of just tried to go down the list and then give them as honest and as reassuring the answer as possible. Right. And not, not over promise. Right. Cause I didn't exactly know how everything was going to go. Um, you know, I couldn't promise that we were going to retain every customer, that that was always a, a risk. But here was what I was going to do, what I was going to try to do new to add and invest in from a business development standpoint, the direction we were going to go and things like that. Right. So, I, you know, and the grade I would give myself, I don't, I don't know. You'd have to ask them to be sure. I, I would, you know, I'm a, I would say like B minus on yeah. some of this because because not everything went 100 percent smooth. Um, but, but I, you know, no, nobody stormed out of there the first day angry, um, or kind of quit in a huff. Um, so it sounds like from a a preparation perspective, it was an A plus plus, if, if anything, um, if we're going to be grading, we're listening to your story, but when you're talking about that as well, what I'm hearing, if I'm hearing correctly, is a lot of this was about setting up and maintaining those relationships and I noted when you you first spoke, you said that the the business owner was very much a sales focused person. That was his role in the company. Yeah. Which, when if you're looking at you know you're taking over a business, if if that's the the element that's getting extracted, that's a really really critical component of the business. Oh but sure. Yet, from, yeah. from that perspective, you have set up a system where you've gone okay. You've worked with the owner and said, I know you're the the critical element of sales. We need to develop this relationship. Um, well, I need to develop a relationship with the customers and you've worked with them and and you had that one-on-one conversations. How important overall, if you were to rank it, um, is this element of creating and maintaining relationships for a business owner to focus on? Oh, yeah, no, it, absolutely. And it, 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 part of it is like the type of business that you're in, right? And I, you can kind of use like the, the kind of vague term of brand, right? Like what's what's the association? Is it with the name of the company? Like is it MySpan Systems or is it the one-on-one relationship with the, the principal that's behind it? Or is it the relationship with the person that's actually doing the work for us? Or the person that is in support or the person that handles um like your ARAP that you know they're getting invoices back and forth from this person all the time, right? Where is it in that that is the really critical part? And and to a certain extent it's all of it, right? Because I I've said to our folks like every time we we touch a customer, it it is a marketing event. We have to think of it as like we are positioning mm. ourselves and we're either diminishing or increasing our relationship with them. And for us, like a big part of that, because of the nature of what we do is is trust, um, right? So some of the things we kind of talk about, even in rather mundane things, is um, our, our ability to both make and keep promises is a really important critical action, even for stuff that seems rather mundane, right? If, if we say, you know, we are going to call you on Tuesday, there is no excuse to not make that call on Tuesday or let you know where we need to reschedule it a day or two before, right? What is not okay is just not showing up on Tuesday or mm-hmm. not following up when we say we're going to follow up or not meeting a commitment we've made to them, right? That's like a big deal, even for like small things. So it's, it's that idea of the important part, the critical part, is the promise that's made and the trust that our clients have in us, even in the small stuff. Um, and so like, that's, that's a big part of it. And that's one of those things that kind of gets beyond any 
singular person, right? Particularly if they're dealing with more than one person and they see that behavior consistently repeated. Like, again, for us, we're like the most paramount thing we have is our clients trust in us because of what they trust us to do. We try to, we try to do, we try to emphasize that more than anything else. What I'm hearing from what you said there is beyond more than one person. It sounds like you have very, very good systems in place to ensure that happens. As you said, if you, if you say you're going to call on Tuesday, it must happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and to ensure that happens uh, consistently, you can't rely on just a person to remember that. You need to have systems in place. What kind of systems need to be prioritized to ensure that level of commitment, that level of consistency is implemented within a business? Yeah, there's some, there's some tools we use. Um, yeah, obviously, from a sales standpoint, we have a CRM. We, you know, we kind of use that for our communications. And, and th th that kind of helps sequence certain things and kind of pr particularly when you're kind of going through introductions to new clients to make sure you, you hit all the steps and everything that needs to happen. And, you know, when we have a new client, we have a, we have an onboarding process that we go through that, you know, at the beginning of signing, it's like, okay, here's, here's exactly what we're going to do. It's step one through five. We're going to do this. 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 These three things will happen automatically, but this other one needs, we need you involved with, and it's got to be done at a certain day, right? So try to be very clear on that and kind of using like a checklist approach for it. Um, the other things that are more ad hoc, th th this kind of comes through, you know, really reinforcement uh, of what we're doing. Um, so, and that, that I see as primarily my job, right? To kind of set, set the tone, set the expectations for like, this is what it means to work here. This is what it means if you're a client of ours. Um, and, you know, I, I primarily do that by number one, reinforcing some of these ideals, like the idea of, you know, we make commitments and we keep them um, to the point where I'm sick of hearing myself. Cause I know I need to way over communicate that. And, and I will say it, probably five to 10 times, you know, for every one time any individual sees it, right? Here's it. So every week, my communications to everybody, it's, you know, reinforcing that over and over and over again, you know, in until I think, am I saying this too much? Is this like, am I, you know, am I really boring people? Like you have to get to that level of like over communicate and, and then finding ways to, highlight when that behavior gets done, right? To really kind of reward that behavior. And so every chance that I have to find, to kind of catch somebody doing the right thing, you know, for, for lack of a better term, where I can say, hey, let me tell you an example of what somebody did with a client. Here's the story. Here's what happened. Here's the result. Um, you know, I, I think if there's something that I don't do enough to kind of reinforce that culture, it's probably that um, and part of that is we're, we're a fairly flat organization. Um, you know, I, I, I really only have kind of one and a half layers of, of management because we're relatively small, you know, probably about 15 FTE and then, you know, some freelancers, about another two dozen about that, that we kind of bring in for individual products. But we still try to keep everybody in the loop on that. Um, but there, there's not a layer, there's there's not a really tight kind of command and control layer of management where somebody's watching somebody do it every day. So that like that gets a little bit harder because just the nature of our business, what we do, like we, we don't do necessarily that level of monitoring or inspection of of our own um, work outside of things like our formal DevOps process and how we do code control and you know, he, all the things that kind of get into like compliance and and how we handle assets and, and property of our clients, that, that that's very rigid in what we do. But just the general day to day, like, hey, I'm going to call you on Tuesday. Like, I'm, I'm typically not going to catch that unless I'm involved in, in the whole thing. So you know, like, I think finding more of that and having that opportunity of being able to highlight that and reinforce it and 
and phrase it and do it in you know the the, the broadest way possible that's that's important and that that plays into it and it's you know again reinforcing exactly the type of behavior and the attitude you want people to have you mentioned reinforcement there a couple of times in that conversation people are creatures of habit and they operate the same way it takes a, a while to break a habit and that involves some training i mean getting people to do that is it a is it from your perspective a case of you know as you said just saying it over and over and again um you also mentioned if i heard that correctly was you re- rewarding what i term rewarding the right behavior so when something mm-hmm. someone is an example of what to do you're, you're rewarding that behavior or, or making it known as opposed mm-hmm. to chastising people when they don't do the right thing mm-hmm. how much of an impact do you think those have on creating that change where it needs to happen where you're you're rewarding the behaviors that you want yeah um so so two two points on that and i will say this is much my style and what i've seen to work um I, I very from a just from a leadership philosophy standpoint, I am very much about praise in public, um, criticizing in, in private. Right? Like, it, it, I will absolutely make corrections where corrections are due, but I am loath to do that in any other context than a private one-on-one with somebody, because I want I want the I obviously want the, the correction made and I want the behavior changed, but I don't want to layer on any humiliation or, you know, public ridicule with that as well. Cause that's, you know, lemon on the cut. And, and that's probably more to the fact that what we do and, and generally the people that we hire are all seasoned professionals. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I think maybe we've made one like new out of college hire, like somebody who didn't have a lot of work experience. But a lot of what we do when we bring people in, like, you know, they're five, 10 years into their career at that point. And we've already filtered them out for, again, because of the needs of our customers and everything, fairly mature people, right? Um, which means you have a little bit older older group, older employees, very different than when I was in the army, I will say, where like nobody was over 21. I think when I was in the, well, yeah, one or two, but the like the average age was about 18 and a half, right? So mm. different crowd required different, different levers and different approach. But, um, you know, that's, that's less of an issue. But, but the other one is, boy, there was, there was a great book. I have to think, do I have it here? Um, it was Don Clifton was the author, um, but it was it was called How Full Is Your Bucket, mm-hmm. um, and it was a great. It, you familiar with the book? I've heard of it. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. the, 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 you're right. The premise of the book was basically saying, look, like you have like you know this emotional connection with people that you interact. with. Right. Mm-hmm. Whether you think it's there or not, it's there. Yeah. And, you you know, you can kind of think of them. The analogy he would use is you kind of think of them as like holding this bucket. Mm-hmm. And you're either going to take, you know, like your ladle or your spoon with water in it. And you're either going to like add water to the bucket or you're going to spoon some out. Right? Yeah. Sometimes it's benign, but most of the time you're either adding water or taking it out. Now, if, if you got to go in there and correct somebody and point out that they made a mistake, particularly to somebody who takes a lot of pride to work, like you're scooping some water out, right, mm. in, in, that, in that interaction. And it might be necessary. You have to like keep tally and understand that and go out of your way to replace that water in another, mm. in another interaction. Even yeah. if it's just, you know, things that are, that are there to, that, that's not saying like lay false praise on someone, but you got to mm. go out of your way to understand like you've taken something from this person and you got to find a way to put it back. Mm. Whether that's, that's, you know, the attaboy that's well-deserved the the, like, let me spend a little bit extra time. Tell me about, you, you know, the vacation you went on. Tell me about what's going on. Let me ask very introspective questions about, 
your family, your outside interests, or you, you know, in in a way that is that is genuine and human. But understand, like, you you got to work on that, right? And, mm. and there's some ratio he has in there, and it's it's like ten to one or something. Right? It's yeah. it's a lot. M- meaning, you have to make sure you have way more positive interactions than you have negative. Mm. Um, now, I will say that is not a universally adopted. Um, uh, belief in things. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I mean, you'll see. You know, people people talk about you know the 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 management of management style of like Steve Jobs, right? And, mm-hmm. and he obviously went through there. There's Steve Jobs' his first time at Apple, and Steve Jobs' his second time at Apple, right? And both times he was a very demanding person. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you when you look at like you know the Isaacson book or um, becoming Steve Jobs is another great one uh, as well. You, you look at the impact that him working with Ed Catmull at Pixar had, mm. right? That Ed Catmull from Pixar, who's now at, at Disney, um, probably one of the greatest leaders of artists and technically minded people of all time. Right. Mm. And, you, you know, the impact that everyone from the outside who, who knew him talked about, like how much that changed his approach to things and, and how he approached other people and how he dealt with them. Still very demanding, um, but also understanding of, you know, putting things in instead of just being a straight up tyrant all the time, mm. uh, which he was rightfully accused of. Uh, you know, in his, his first tenure at Apple, um, to to you know being more of a of let me set the bar very high, you know, more in the line of like what you see from like professional coaches, right? Professional sports coaches along that line. Very very different. Um, but I don't think that he was ever a thirteen to one. I'm going to fill your bucket up type guy, right? He may but have to been, put but that I in didn't, context, didn't too, it, I think, came yeah. Across, right? but, yeah. Cause, and, and you know that from your military experience, because I, I was in the, the military as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and as the, there's always the adage of always be careful of the story return from wounded soldiers, because sure. things get tend to be inflated. And, and to that to that point with Steve Jobs, yes, as you said, he's very demanding. But the, from what I've read, a lot of people that were complaining were people that actually didn't survive there. Um, oh sure, that. yeah. So the, the, there was a lot of people that stayed on. There's been a lot of time there as well. Yeah. How much do you need to take that into account as a leader and go? Well, sometimes my decisions are not going to be liked, and, oh, sure. and sometimes yeah. there's not a fit. I remember Mary Barra, um, one of her speeches at mm-hmm. GM when they made the transition, said we're going to go electric. I, I mean, I wasn't in the room, but this was what my understanding of what she said, and I'm paraphrasing. But she said to her, she pulled in all the senior managers and said, okay, here's the plan going forward. And she laid out the plan. And then she said, if you're not 100% on board with this plan, that's okay. We'll make an appointment with HR and find somewhere else for you to be. And she made right. it very clear, this is the path yeah. we're going. Um, you have a choice as to whether you want to be on that path. How much of that do you need to be as a leader of a, a company to be very clear about where you're going and make that, you know, that is clear. It's, again, in the military, when you look at it, as a captain of a, a Navy ship, the first priority mm-hmm. is to the ship. Um, whether yeah. you like it or not, that that's the priority. How do you, mm-hmm. do you need to have that persona as well in, in as a business owner? Style plays into it, right? Mm. And and you kind of have to be true to yourself, but yeah. at the end of the day, your your job is to set the vision and the strategy for where the the company is going. And, and if mm-hmm. you're you're fortunate enough to be able to have like not even like a COO, but like somebody who handles day to day operations, yeah, then you have the luxury of not only setting the vision but spending most of your time in the future. Most yeah. of the effort you do are in the growth of it. Mm-hmm. Me and my size, I'm not there, right? I'm probably, yeah. I don't know, 60, 40 on that, you know, from, from what I'm doing from a business development standpoint. Um, but but you, you, have, you have to paint this brighter future, right? Mm. This is what tomorrow looks like. This, this is the future that I mm. see, I know we can attain, and this is where we're going, and I want you to come with me. 
and yeah. and you know your job, and and I I I think this is a this is the Seth Godin word in this context is is enrollment. You're mm-hmm. you're trying to get everybody to buy into that that future, mm-hmm. right? Now, how you sell it, how you reinforcement, how you bring that across, it, that's where that style comes, in, right? Mm. How much of it is going to be very much demanding my way or the highway, which in certain contexts works, and how much of it is much more collaborative. Uh, this is what I think. I need you to weigh in. You know, a lot of that is a lot of it's situational. How much time do you have? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you begin to think about. You know, if you're if you're if you're in a in a real startup situation, you're doing something brand new. You're probably you maybe you're even pre revenue, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you have a general idea of where you're going, but you don't know where you're going, and mm-hmm. you don't know what the response is going to be, and you're in that mode of you're searching, right? Um, uh, uh, Steve Blank, uh, f- famously, um, the, what is it? The Four Epiphanies of Startups. I think he, he rewrote that as the um, the startup owner's guide. I think mm-hmm. F- famous, famous, like uh, old scion of Silicon Valley. Like yeah. knows a lot about how this goes. But but he kind of talks about you know startup mode. You're you're an alerting organization. You're a searching organization. You're not there to. You're not a small version of a big company. You're there mm-hmm. just trying to get to the point where you have you know product solution fit or or solution problem fit, and then product market fit. Right. I have mm. a thing that works and I have it structured in a way that we can now scale. And that's mm. that's my whole job. And that traditionally that's like your C and like A round if you're thinking yeah. of, you know, venture back standpoint. It's, you know, that that's your whole job. And in, in, in that case, you have a general idea of what you're doing, maybe you have a general idea of who you're serving, mm-hmm. but you're probably not correct. Yeah. And you're gonna have to change your mind a, a bunch of times. And and you've got to set that up as an expectation for everybody. But then mm-hmm. at some point you go, we found it. This is what it is. This is our market. We're no longer searching for a business model. We found it. We found the approach. Now we're going to go from, you know, 10 customers to a hundred customers to a thousand to a hundred thousand, you know, and this is going to, how we're going to get there and the approach that we're going to take. And that, that becomes that we're now narrowing approach. And so you you think about like where you are in the stage of a company. Think about like how every business in the world went through this in 2020 and 2021, right? You're you're almost de facto in 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 a rescue situation, right? Mm-hmm. You're you're trying to just find a way to survive. You probably don't have 12 to 18 months to figure it out, right? Mm. You might have a month or three months uh, to you know how are we going to bridge through this until. Either the market that I serve returns, um, or we find a different way to exist in this new world. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll tell you an example. We had a uh, a, a client that that worked in um, they, they were in they were building materials it was it was mm-hmm. part of the construction and building materials, and. Um, you know, the the first time in at least in the U.S., you know, all the the lockdown orders started happening. They, basically, they they were shutting factories, right? Because mm. by law they had to, and effectively every project that they had on the books, turn it off, went to zero, right? Well, what happened, right? And that was like a, a big shock. And how are we going to adjust? And what are we going to do? Well, what happened was was everybody at home, like the home renovation market, exploded. Mm. It, like year over year growth was, I, it was well into the double digits, right? Yeah. And they ended up like, not only did they want to like return to where they were from, you know, a month or two later, but it was like, accelerate, go as fast as you can. So we were actually like busier with them uh, in the second half and trying to, you know, within literally weeks to mm. go from business as usual to we're out of business to now maybe we're doing some multiple of what we were doing before. Mm. That's that type of responsiveness of like understanding the situation you're in and trying to, again, with empathy, with as much transparency as you can, 
you know, paint that vision of this is what we're trying to do to help our client and this is how we're going to do it. And, you know, this is the approach. And, and you know, sometimes it's who's on board and who's not. You know, who, who's going to be with us? Yeah. And you mentioned at the very start you have a collaborative approach in in how you, in your leadership style and in the organization that you have. With that as well, we, when we're talking about transitions and technological transitions, and you, you, we mentioned at the start in the intro that you, you deal a bit with AI, and I'm old enough to remember, I'm, I'm older than I look, I'm old enough to remember the dot-com bubble and also bubbles before sure. that. And yeah. when I look back at you know the, the tech bubble, for example, and there was all this thing about, oh, dot-com this, dot-com that, it's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And right. and it did, to, to, to an extent, it changed the way things were happening. But a lot of things that were talked about and were glitched and glamour and, and that was you know what was in the news it just it didn't kind of pan out the way but it became a new way of doing things when you're looking at the transitions that are happening now with ai is that a similar sort of thing where there's a lot of buzz out there but the reality is that it's just going to be a fundamental shift or how do you see that playing out this is a tough one right because like the surefire way to be wrong is try to make a prediction about the future. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, no, I, I certainly have a, a point of view. Here. And, and again, this is based on kind of seeing the first elements of this beginning 10 years ago and kind of where it's evolved. And, and, and certainly with the incredible growth in hype around generative AI and, you know, things that have happened, you know, that that's, a, that's an interesting element to that right because you, you look back at seemingly like chat gpd kind of came out of nowhere right but the the technology for it the thing that made it possible was was really the the transform right that's the t in gpt's transform right yeah which actually came out of google in 2017 i believe is when the first white paper they yeah. published it like publicly here is the research that we are doing right and yeah. that was kind of the to oversimplify the technical shortcut that mm. made something like chat GPT even feasible, you know, yeah. at the scale that it's off. So it, th there, there's an amazing level of capability today, but it's not quite there where I think you see like it's just generally available to, to everything in every situation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like, Moore's law in how well um, you know computer semiconductor technology is advanced. Yeah. We're going to see similar jumps in this going forward, yeah. um, and and it 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 it's going to advance. The thing that was most interesting here, and maybe unlike what we saw in you know the, the internet, um, certainly some of the underlying internet technologies, what we saw in in mobile was the huge impact that open source is going to have in this. Mm. And in fact, okay. you're almost at the point now where the base technology, the, the things that are really powering this from, from a technological layer, mm. open source is like near parity, right? You know, to use yeah. a military tier, it's a, it's a near peer. Yeah. Um, it's very close. To, it's not like five or 10 years behind. It's like there today. You look mm. at things like what um, uh, Meta or Facebook is doing with the, the, their Llama 2 model that they put out and how they've done the licensing around that. And mm. that's, that's like one of the unique things around machine learning and AI. Um, you you kind of look at like, and this, this is a weird cultural thing, right? So you look at some of like the heavy hitters or the ones that have been the heavy hitters. Um, you got Jeffrey Hinton, who he was in and out of Google a couple of times, but he was um, University of Toronto um, mm -hmm. in, in Canada. You have uh, uh, Jan LeCun, uh, who is head of uh, AI at, at Facebook. He's, I think he has a slightly different title than that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Andrew Wick, who he was at Google and then he was at Baidu, but he's always been like a Stanford professor for a long time. He's also one of the either founder or co-founder of Coursera. Mm -hmm. um, all of them, and and many others, but they're kind of like three of the giants, have always had this this um, role of I'm going to work in the commercial space, but I'm also going to work in the academic space, and I'm going to publish what I do. 
and have been very open about what they're doing, which is very unlike a lot of the other kind of technology revolutions where it was like patent based and how am I going to protect and the modes I'm going to create. Very different in the system. Like I said, ChatGPT built upon you know technology that that was invented and openly released by Google only you know four or five years ago. Mm. Um, so that's why you kind of see this this angle uh, around. It. And so one of the one of the premises or, or things that I, I certainly talk to my clients about is the the technology layer the. The, the algorithmic layer of what's going on is not going to be the differentiator. That's mm. not the thing that's going to get ahead or not be on the scale side. But frankly, having these three heavy hitter cloud service providers between um, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon AWS, and Google's um, uh, GCP, uh, Google Cloud Platform, you have access to essentially infinite resources, right? So yeah. it's how much can you pay is, is the thing. It's not the access to that. What is really the interesting part, where the value is, is around the data that you have to drive those systems, to drive the process. And it's mm -hmm. primarily the first party data that you have. The data that you have about your company, about your customers, about how your market works, about all the things about your play in there that are not public. You know, think about the questions that you have to, that you can't ask chat GPT today because it doesn't mm. know that you have to look inside to do, right? To, mm. to find those answers. For Who are my most valuable customers? Who has been uh, trending higher from a lifetime value standpoint? Uh, mm. Which of my competitors is on the rise and which are on the decline from yeah. you know, who we see in deals? How mm -hmm. does my pricing compare to my competitor? How do my costs compare to my competitors? Like all of these things, these are the things that are going to drive um, yeah. a lot of um, your competitiveness in the future. Yeah. So understanding that, and, and again, I work in, in industries and with clients where their first party data is much more seen as a liability. It is, mm. it is, you know, there are multiple agencies that have a compliance hammer waiting to hit them in the head with, uh, <laughs> if they screw up, if they have a data breach, if they yeah. don't do it correctly, if they use the data in the wrong way, mm. particularly in like banking, anything that has to do with housing, oh, Lord, like the hoops they have to jump through and the way that yeah. they have to prove what they're doing is within not only like multiple laws, but multiple laws at multiple agencies. It, it's it's very difficult. So they mm. are rightly protective of that. And they see data and data governance as a compliance issue. Yeah. This data to be like it, it, the compliance of it. If I could lock it down and never use it, my job would be a lot easier. The problem is they're not able to take advantage of it at that. Mm. And not take advantage is in break the law, but be able to provide a better service to their customers, better from their customer's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Something that offers more value to me, allows me to, you know, takes huge headaches off my plate, allows me to do things that I have to do yes. faster yes. with less effort on my point, on, on my point. Maybe from a mobile context, instead of having to be in the office or having to be in front of the client or having to come to one of your branches for like larger transactions, whatever the thing, is, right? All of those elements, your ability to leverage that data to serve better, more competitive services and products to your customers, mm -hmm. that is going to be an increasingly valuable asset that you have. So to kind of change that mindset from you know, data is a liability to data as an asset. Maybe one of the most valuable assets we have, more than anything mm. that we might have on our balance sheet. That I think that's going to be the bigger shift in the next years, right? Maybe decades. Yeah, because I was wondering about that from that AI perspective, because again, it only knows what it's been taught and the information mm -hmm. it has access to. And I know from my perspective, when I've been using AI and putting my technology or asking questions about technologies that I've developed that I haven't published, that I haven't shared, mm -hmm. and certainly not on the internet, 
it doesn't understand and it doesn't comprehend and right. it is not able to actually do that. So if I'm hearing right. you, yeah, it's not able to process it or give really good answers in that perspective because I look at it and go, I, I feel like I'm talking to a 12, uh, well, five-year-old really. It just it doesn't yeah. get it. Um, yeah. And is that where you see that value being in in, his, in you being able to manage and 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 understand your own data so that you can actually extract that value from that and and be a competitive right. advantage because you actually have that and then it's it's isolated within your own silo and, and no one else mm-hmm. has that correct absolutely what what is what is your ability to to basically use like the institutional knowledge mm-hmm. of your organization to use that to to be more competitive to better serve your customers mm-hmm. um, that's that's really what the trick is. Um, so I'll give you I'll give you one example. Um, one of the things. So again, my primary market, like who who we're going after, is what we refer to as community financial institutions, which are really community banks and credit unions. Credit unions in the U.S. is is a is a nonprofit, um, a, a nonprofit bank. A lot of times, it's tied to. Um, either a, a specific employer or a specific community or people with like a specific job, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a different structure around a bank that mm-hmm. still functions as a bank. Um, one of the things there is, is the concern that smaller banks, and this is, this has been a greatly bigger concern this year after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Citibank Bank and the acquisition of Republic and now, the, you know, the kind of a forced sale of PacWest, this, this idea that, you know, banks of a certain size are risky, you know, and there's a flight to safety. So far, that hasn't happened with smaller community banks, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the concerns is a lot of these, like, local institutions, they, ha- they have a, a, a fantastic franchise. With, with their communities. Mm-hmm. However, they've had a more and more difficult time attracting younger customers. Kind of the okay. tail end of Gen Z, uh, tail end of millennials and particularly Gen Z. Right? Mm-hmm. So you look at the average age of their customer and it's ticking along, not quite at one year every year, their average age, but it's not zero, right? Yeah. And so their, their customer base is getting older and older and older as time goes on. And it's this idea of how do we stay relevant to younger customers? Well, one of the things that we will help our, our clients do is, you know, take a lot of, there's there's very good public data that's available um, from several private sources, but but primarily in, in the U.S., the U.S. Census Department. They do every mm. 10 years, they do a census, and they, they actually have statistical models that they update every quarter. Um, yeah. But you can kind of look through and say, okay, here are the zip codes that you serve. It's part of your community. Mm. What is just just from the age standpoint? What is the makeup of those communities? Yeah. And what is your market share by age group? And how has that changed over ten years? And that gets a mm. little tricky when you start doing longer time period. Yes. But that's usually an eye opening exercise mm. for for our clients to look at and go, oh, look look, you know, our yes, I know our community has grown by X percent. But it's really only grown within these two five-year um, age brackets, and mm. we have not grown at all in there. So even though maybe our deposits have grown and we're ticking along, we're actually losing from a you know headcount standpoint. Our share mm. is going down. Yeah. What are we doing to address that? How do we better target this this part of the growing market that we're not going at? Right. And it's just it's looking at the market through a different lens, a different approach, and it, primarily using publicly available data and the data that only you have to, mm. to do that. And like, that's a, that's a real low level, like low hanging fruit approach to how, how can we use this to kind of better affect our strategy? Yeah. And in this case, even if it's dollars for dollars, even on the growth, it's giving you a, you know, you start thinking about this in terms of lifetime value, right? If, if you're doing something that's actively bringing in younger customers, Mm-hmm. They're going to be with you if your retention is there for a much longer time frame, right? Which which vastly grows your lifetime value, and mm. maybe you get them like before they hit their peak earnings, right? And that mm. grows even more. So, like, 
it, it gets very complicated very quick to kind of change from this view of revenue and cost by business unit or by product line to let's turn that to looking at it from a customer standpoint. Mm. You know, what is our, our revenue and our cost and the profitability by customer, by customer segment? And then getting beyond demographics, that's kind of like the next yeah. place that you go, right? Behavioral things. When people yeah. enter a certain segment because of like life events that happen, being able to identify that and being yeah. proactive in, in showing up in front of your customer with a solution to their problem that they may not even began to shop for, right? Yeah. But it's but it's there. And so that you're the first mind, like, yeah, I trust these guys. They're absolutely the one that I want to go to. Yeah. I, I love that focus that you have. It's really very customer orientated, solution focused. And you, and you just wrap that up in a nice nutshell there as well. Um, before we finish this, do you want to tell us a little bit about your, the services you do and the, and the and what you provide for the customers. Sure. Yeah. So, so like I said, we we work with with community financial institutions, and credit unions. Um, and you know what what we're helping them do is really make that transition to be more data driven in in their approach, and, and that is very much from a solving a profitability standpoint, a growth and profitability standpoint. Credit unions technically don't draw profits, but then that, that it becomes a sustainability uh, issue there. But to be more relevant to their customers and the communities that, that they support. And that takes a lot of different forms. And, and a lot of it is just helping them look at things from a different perspective. But invariably what happens is there's, there's a stepwise jump they need to make from a data standpoint. And, and really a lot of it is like organizational change, like, like that idea of kind of going from a liability to an asset and being able to kind of help them do that and help all of the competing um, requirements they have in size. So, you know, we're not only there providing the technical skill to do it, but also the way of how do we position this and pitch this internally so everybody's happy with the whole thing. So compliance is happy. So it's, it fits with the strategy of where, you know, your chief executive and the board wants to go. And it, it's accretive, right? And so the CFO is happy. That, that's always like the, the win for us is, is when the CFO wants to give you more money for your budget because it's a great bet for them to go for. That's, that's the win. That's what we're going for. And depending on the organization and where they are, you know, their size and where they are in the growth standpoint and really what their market opportunity is, you know, is it a small stepwise, let's do a pilot or let's do a much larger project? Or a lot of times it's let's help you rescue an effort that's maybe stalled out or or hit on the rocks because, you know, you kind of tried to do something internally without necessarily having these like big project skills in there, right? Like, a lot of the folks that we deal with, you know, that like in their title is architect. And that's one of those things that if, if you're going to take a big step like this, you might only do it once every 10 years, something of this scale, uh, or at least that has this level of impact. It is not worth a small institution's effort to have like architectural skills on board because th they're just not going to get the experience. So it's much better to come in, help us take this jump. And either get us to the point where we can handle this ourselves or help us build those capabilities in-house so that, you know, we can maintain it and go on and hit our growth path that we want to. And that's that's what we're really there to do. We're kind of helping them, you know, giving them a boost up to that next level. What's the best way for people to reach you uh, and find out more details? Yeah, so our website is, is mindspaninc.com. Um, to reach out to me, the, the best place and where I'm most active is on LinkedIn, and I'm, I'm Rich Edwards on LinkedIn. Awesome. And we'll include all those details in the show notes as well for, for the listeners. And for the listeners, before we wind up, can you share what you would like them to take away from this interview? What would be the key thing in a nutshell that you think would be most helpful for them to take away and implement. Yeah. I, I think that idea of first party data is valuable 
and it's getting more valuable. That idea of we need to get our hands wrapped around that and really think about it from a true governance, like big G governance standpoint, that that, that is something that should be on your radar somewhere. And not just the CIO. It's not a it's not a technical issue, it's a business issue. I love that. Rich, that's so much I've got so many more questions I want to ask you, but we have run out of time. Um, maybe we can do a part two at some point because I've sure, got this anytime. massive, massive, massive list. But Rich, yeah, thank you. If for- you just want to come back and do rapid fire QA, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, now that's awesome. We'll, we'll we'll actually do that. So we'll we'll organize a part two. That'd be great because you know, I, I've got this big, big. If you can see my screen, I've been taking notes while I was off camera, and um and and taking all these notes. So there's there's lots of things I'd love to chat about. But thank you for taking the time to be on Growing Revenue and Profit. It's been wonderful having you here. Great. Thanks for having me.